It is an emergency pick six podcast. Shane Steichen got a new job. It's me, Ryan Wilson, joined by Tyler Sullivan. The Colts have made it official. They hired Shane Steichen most recently of the Philadelphia Eagles. Second best team in the division. If you're listening along with our great producer, Debo and or Billy uh, Sully, how surprised in a scale of one to 1.5 are you? that the Colts decided to go in this direction after we sort of knew about it a few days ago. Right. We sort of knew about it, but the longer you, you go, and obviously you have to wait till after the Super Bowl, but f- until we heard it officially, I, in the back of my mind, was like, this is going to be Jeff Saturday, right? Like, right. at some point, Jim Irsay is going to come bursting through the doors and say, nope, I want my buddy still to take the interim tag off and be the head coach of this team. So the longer we kind of went without this officially happening, you get a little bit nervous that Irsay is going to Irsay. But ultimately, no, this is not that surprising because of all the momentum that we saw or because you can't really hire the guy before he's eliminated or the playoffs are done. And now that Philadelphia is season's over, the Super Bowl's over, it paves the way for Steichen to become the next head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. Yeah, and you mentioned just before we started the podcast, the youngest head coach hired in Colts history. He's 37 years old. Uh, he went to UNLV, if you're interested in such things. And he started his NFL coaching career in 2011 when he's hired by then San Diego Chargers to be a defensive assistant, went to the offensive side of the ball, obviously did wonderful things the last few years in Philadelphia as the offensive coordinator. We saw Jalen Hurts blossom into one of the best players in the NFL and arguably the best player on the field uh, on Sunday in Glendale, Arizona. Um, so you sort of touched on it, Sully. If you're a Colts fan, and obviously they have needs at, at quarterback, they pick ninth overall. How excited are you that you get someone with this track record? Are you at all nervous that it's going to be – just because it's the name that popped in my head, a Josh McDaniels round one situation where, and I say this all the time, sometimes you can be great at one job and you get another job and you're not great at it. And there's a huge difference between being a coordinator and being a head coach. Yeah, I mean, there's always the risk with that. It's not just the Josh McDaniels thing. It's it's anytime you elevate these coordinators, you know, is it a great, you know, guy to bring up from special teams, defensive side of the ball? Yeah, they might have their quirks and their specialties, but when you put them into that lead role, there's always going to be questions about whether or not they're able to handle that seat. But just looking at it from an Indianapolis perspective, to bring in Steichen, you talked about Jalen Hurts, but you look at what he's the quarterbacks he's been around with during his coaching career. Phillip Rivers, Hurts, Justin Herbert. I mean, that right there is a solid pedigree of quarterbacks that have the experience around of coaching and coaching them at a high level, obviously. Justin Herbert is one of the best young quarterbacks in the NFL right now. He helped Jalen Hurts get to be a runner-up for league MVP. And Phillip Rivers is a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback. So to be around that type of a talent, when we all assume that Indianapolis is going to draft a young quarterback, finally get off of that path of bringing in veterans and kind of trying to see if they can recreate what they were in previous spots and start anew now with a young quarterback, that's what's exciting. I mean, you look what he was able to do with Justin Herbert during his rookie year. And again, Herbert's a special player, but Herbert, 31 touchdowns, completed 66.6% of his passes back in 2020. If he's able to help cultivate a young quarterback that they take in the first round this year or whenever they take one, that is going to get Colts fans excited. Right, and not they don't pick ninth. That's the Panthers, as Debo pointed out to me. They pick fourth, so they even have a better chance against the quarterback they want. So, you know, we talk about Jim Irsay being crazy and doing things like hiring Jeff Saturday as the interim coach, even though Jeff Saturday uh, has spent the previous weeks working at ESPN calling out teams like the Raiders, and that went about as we expected. But is Jeff Saturday the blip, Sully, or is Irsay secretly uh, a mad genius? Because you look at the coaches he's hired, Frank Reich, great coach. Chuck Pagano, great coach. Jim Caldwell, Tony Dungy, and Jim Mora, I think were all hired when Ursay was was the owner. because his, his dad owned the team before he did, and he was just part of the, the front office. That, that feels like you're batting. Those are Hall of Fame numbers. Yeah, you're doing extremely well. And again, the Ursay thing, I mean, ex- excuse me, the Saturday thing is just weird because you had no prior head coaching experience. You're just like totally out of left field. I will say this. He did have support in the room. I know Darius Leonard was saying during Super Bowl week that he really liked Jeff Saturday and what he was bringing to the table. And so, you know, he had some support in that locker room. So at least from that perspective, players liked him. But yeah, that in its own is a weird thing. But he does have a tremendous record in terms of hiring these head coaches. The one thing that I find interesting with Steichen, and, and we're talking about a previous hire that Ursay made in Frank Reich, there is some crossover here. He, he coached under him with, with obviously, in, uh, in San Diego, now obviously L.A. with the Chargers. And obviously, Nick Sirianni 
has some relationships with Frank Wright as well. So you are still kind of plucking from that coaching tree that you just fired. So I, I do find that a little interesting, no? Yeah, and also, as you were talking, it is also interesting that uh, Sirianni slash Shanahan slash McVay uh, slash Andy Reid, those coaching trees are flourishing. The Belichick Tomlin trees, not so much. And for various different reasons, I don't know what those reasons are, but it it, it is curious. And uh, as a Steelers fan who would desperately like to get a new offensive coordinator, it, it pains me to no end to see these young offensive coordinators getting elevated head coaching jobs, but even moving around the league, the, the, the passing coordinators, uh, Bobby Slowick has gone from San Francisco now to Houston, but that's a conversation for a different time. So, look, uh, it doesn't matter. You could have the aforementioned McVay, Shanahan, Belichick, Tomlin on the same staff. If you don't have a quarterback, it, it doesn't matter. It right. just it, it doesn't. And as we sit here, the Panthers, the Panthers, the Panthers don't either, but the, the, the uh, Colts do not have a quarterback. Now, recent history says free agency or trade is a terrible idea. Matt Ryan. Uh, Debo's Carson Wentz. You see the graphic here if you watch on YouTube. Philip Rivers, Jacoby Brissett, and then you go to Andrew Luck, which was sort of the, the turning point in this team's uh, history prior to Peyton Manning. Are you going the free agency route? Or are you focused on the draft? Let me give you some names here of free agents. Quotation marks: Tom Brady. That would be a hysterical view at Indianapolis. But more re realistically, you have the Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Jimmy Garoppolo of the world, Teddy Bridgewater. I think Daniel Jones probably returns to. To the Giants, that's no real surprise there. Geno Smith, the same in Seattle. Uh, and then after that, it, you're sort of grasping the straws. Joe Flacco, Andy Dalton, uh, my guy Mason Rudolph, and Case Keenum. Anything there? Is there anything there that Sykin can work with and cobble together, get to seven wins, and then find a way to to luck his way to two other wins? Well, I'm sure he can. I mean, if they bring in like a guy like Garoppolo or something along those lines or Derek Carr, then sure, yeah, you can piece things along and, and, and be a competitive football team. But what are you really building? I mean, those are older quarterbacks you're not going to hire a young up-and-coming head coach to just bring in a veteran to kind of string along for a few years you want to try to build something that's sustainable for the long term so for me that's a young quarterback for me that's going into the draft taking as many stabs as you can and now if you want to bring back like J uh, Jacoby Brissett to be this kind of stopgap guy while you draft and develop and you wait and see whenever this guy that you do draft is able to play whether it's in week one or week seven or in 2024 sure that's fine, but that should not be the plan to say, okay, X veteran is now going to be our guy. We're going to see this thing through like they've done with Ryan Wentz Rivers over the last few years. As we've seen, it doesn't work, especially when they aren't Matthew Stafford, Russell Wilson, even though that didn't work out, Tom Brady, these elite quarterbacks. Like if you if you swing that type of a deal, if you go get Aaron Rodgers, well then all right, fine. That's that makes all the <laughs> sense in the world because it's Aaron Rodgers. But I don't think that you try to waste years in your rebuild and waste your years developing Steichen as a head coach with a old, mediocre type of a quarterback. I think you try to go young and you try to build things with a little bit of a stronger foundation. No, I think that's right. So let me put this scenario to you and, and tell me what you think. Colts won four games last year, 4-12-1. and one. I think this quarterback class is better than last year's quarterback class. You don't have to be uh, this, this, the junior draft analyst to figure that out, Sully. You know that as well. Kenny Pickett went 20th last year. I didn't think he should have gone to the Steelers 20th. I didn't think he was the best quarterback. He actually played pretty well in some trying conditions. The offensive line stunk early on. They got better. The offensive coordinator stunk throughout. Somehow kept his job. That's another conversation. Uh, the defense was really good. Now, on paper, the Colts probably aren't as good as the Steelers from – Roster spot two to 53 and number one being the quarterback, but they're not that far off. So is that a blueprint? I mean, you have the fourth pick. You're going to get a much better quarterback conceivably than Kenny Pickett. And maybe you bring back Jacoby on a one-year deal or, or whatever your Mitch Trubisky uh, ice cream flavor of choice is. And there's a realistic opportunity to get the, to get to the 98 I was talking about before, but now you have the quarterback getting the experience and, and going from there. And if you're watching on YouTube, Debo, puts up all the, the, the top quarterbacks according to CBSSports.com. Bryce, CJ, Will Levis, Anthony Richardson, Hinton Hooker, and uh, Cameron Ward's on the list, but I think he's returning to Washington State. But what do you think about that scenario? Well, yeah, and, and one thing that we have to think about, too, big picture-wise, as we're looking to kind of recreate this Colts team is they play in the AFC South. We think, maybe, or at least I think, that Tennessee – might be on the verge of a reset. They oh, they can get out of Ryan Tannehill's contract, kind of clear about $17.8 million. So they may be in a quarterback change this year. Houston's obviously still in a rebuild. Jacksonville is the team that's ascending 
with Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson. Finally, they're getting he their head coaching situation right. And also, let's, you know, we're saying they have the number four overall pick, but there's a team that's sitting at number one that's not taking a quarterback. So if they fall in love with any of these guys, you can make a move with the Chicago Bears to move up to number one. So this and is we've already established step. that uh, Jim Irsay is willing to do crazy things. That's true, right? Maybe he trades Jeff Saturday's rights to Chicago or something along those <laughs> lines. We'll, we'll see what they do. But, yes, I, I do think that bringing along that young guy, whoever they do like, makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I'm on board with you on that. Okay, so let, let's let's sort of refocus this to the draft because a quarterback has to be in the conversation at number four. You can stay put at number four and, and certainly get someone. The concern is if you fall in love with a Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or, or Will Levis, whomever it may be, that someone's going to leapfrog you because as you noted, the, there's no way the Bears are taking a quarterback at the top of the draft and they almost certainly won't stay put there. So so that's the math you have to worry about. And then I don't know how far you've gotten <laughs> into looking at these quarterbacks, but I, it is impossible for me to sort of figure out who um Jim Irsay might like, but it just based on Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning, I mean, Will Levis feels sort of like that guy if, if they're all walking down the street together. Same size. Will Levis has probably lifted a few more weights than, than Peyton Manning in recent years. Um, so will Will Levis be there for? Probably. Does Irsay seem like someone who's patient enough to wait? Not so much. So my question to you is, let's say you love Will Levis and you're the owner, Sully. And you think like, there's a 50-50 chance some team trades up for him or takes him before you get on the clock at pick four. Uh, how much are you willing to give up? Like draft? You, are, are you? What are you you're doing? aggressive. You're aggressive. I don't know what aggressive technically is because as we go to year to year, these these draft picks are more or less valuable. The number one overall pick in some years is worth way more than it is in other years because of the talent that's coming out. So that is a kind of a sliding scale, but. I am aggressive. If you're Indianapolis, like I said, you're in a division that is winnable. I, I would say that, you know, obviously Jacksonville, I feel like is a, a step above, but it's not like they're Kansas City or they're Buffalo. They're, they're on their way because they have a young, talented quarterback and a good head coach now in Doug Peterson. But it's still attainable if you hit the right button. So and that first button, of course, is getting the quarterback. So if you feel confidently that you want Will Levis and you feel like you have to just make a maybe extend yourself a little bit more than you would normally for a quarterback, I would because of the years that you just had. Those were lean years going through <laughs> mediocre quarterbacks, especially this last one. So I would do what's necessary. Now, I, I don't know what that necessarily is. I don't know if I'm giving up like five first-round picks to get up to number one, but I am, I am extending myself to a certain degree to get there. Now, my question is we're talking about Will Levis in the sense of Jim Irsay. But what about Shane Steichen? What kind of quarterback do we think that he likes? Because that's really the more important question, right? What quarterback does he feel like he can coach best? Because Herbert and Rivers are a little bit different than Hurts. Hurts way more mobile than those two guys. I would I mean, put Hurts and Herbert in the same basket. And okay. Rivers in it because Herbert's athletic. Sure. And is he more athletic than Will Levis? I don't. I'm not sure because Will Levis was so banged up last year, but um, he's bigger. They both have big arms, and they can run if you need them to. Hertz obviously takes that to another level. Yeah. And that's also an interesting point because Bryce Young is as, as athletic as Will Levis. He weighs 35, 40 pounds less than Will Levis. Uh, C.J. Stroud proved that he could run in that Georgia game, and we had not seen that at any point, but he could do it. And But he feels like more of a pocket passer. That's a great question because I, I – I, and that's one I'll have to put to our guy, Rick Spielman, uh, um, when we did the old draft pod about his thoughts on that, because it's important, right? And you would imagine that Shane Steichen can have that conversation with Jim Irsay. Um, although, I don't know, it feels like the Irsay interviews are probably the weirdest interviews you could go to. Although all these guys are billionaires and, and live a different life than we live. But I would imagine that Irsay, you know, he's a big guitar collector. Like I can see him bringing out the guitars and asking Shane Steichen to, to, for his favorite song, like something weird like that. Um, that said, he took the job. And let me ask you this, as our resident Patriots homer, did we ever find out why McDaniels moonwalked out of that job days after getting it when he got the Colts job years ago? I don't think we know definitively. There's a billion rumors as to why, whether from a Patriots side, it's Robert Kraft telling him basically he's going to be the next head coach when Bill Belichick retires, similar to what I feel like has gone on this offseason with Jerron Mayo. Right. But there's also the more conspiratorial – Maybe he heard about Andrew Luck wavering in terms Ooh. of his career. So, you know, none of that's definitive, but 
that's that's kind of been the hubbub, you know, or whatever. You put the tinfoil hat on, and then that's what everybody's talking about. But I heard it. I heard it was Arce asking Josh Williams his favorite guitar song. <laughs> That, that's that's probably a little bit more likely, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I, okay. So I think we can agree. Number four has to be a quarterback unless they trade up. I, I can't imagine that they're going to be in the free agency market for a um, for a quarterback after how things have transpired. And let's see. Debo, I want to ask you, because Debo's with us back from the Super Bowl after he, he's not he's not in a good place, but he's still he's still Debo. We still love him. Debo, is there any any players do you think that may make their way from Philadelphia to um, Indianapolis. Zach Pascal, originally a Colt, I do believe. His he's in, he's hitting free agency. I'm looking over the list here of guys that are going to be. Free I mean the 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 main offensive free agents, Miles Sanders and and Boston Scott. I think Miles Sanders could command somewhat of a, a bigger salary. I don't know if the Colts, you know, go after that with Jonathan Taylor in place, but Boston Scott, kind of that variety back that can do a little bit of everything scores in the red zone can use them in multiple ways. I, I think Steichen really liked using him. I mean, that's, that's kind of the option that I would say outside of Pascal. I mean, I'm not even joking. Like James Bradbury is a good player. He's going to be a free agent. He wouldn't be bad in Indianapolis. No. Like I thought he had a good game. Uh, although, you know, people are whinging about how the game ended and they're actually not bra- blaming Bradbury. They're blaming them the officials. Well, if we're talking about personnel too, and I'm just looking right now, the Colts are 13th in the NFL in available cap space around 11.8, 11.9 million dollars. I'm sure they'll cut things around to increase that a little bit more. But the thing that I think is the most fascinating part of it for you know for someone who's following a team that would love a wide receiver is Michael Pittman. Because he's heading into the final year of his deal. He's one of these guys that is like AJ Brown of last year looking for an extension. If there's not going to be one, is there a trade involved? You're bringing in a new head coach, probably a rookie quarterback. You would think that you would want to lock somebody in like that. So I would watch Michael Pittman if you're an Indianapolis Colts fan because you want that extension to be hit. You want him to be there as an outlet for your young quarterback, along with Jonathan Taylor out of the backfield. Because if you're not, you're talking about somebody who may be expendable in a trade. And if that's the case, to kind of tie things back into what we were looking at earlier, if you know that you're not going to sign Michael Pittman long-term, he might be somebody that you could use along with the number four overall pick to go up to number one to Chicago, who has been dying for a wide receiver for Justin Fields. So if you know you're not signing a player like that, Disrespectful that to Chase Claypool, but go ahead. <laughs> that's true. That could help <laughs> propel you to the number one overall pick as well. So that's a player that I'm watching because I want the Patriots to have a wide receiver, but also he could be a chip for you to help move up to get a quarterback or you try to retain to help the guy that you do bring in at number four. No, that's a good point. And the interesting thing is to bring it back to the, the Steelers analogy is that Kenny Pickett had the, had the pleasure of playing with Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool until they traded him. And then, of course, George Pickens came out of nowhere as we say, there you have in the Colts you're looking for a, a rookie quarterback. You have Michael Pittman, Alec Pierce, and that's about it. Right. So if you trade Michael Pittman, you better have a backup plan, whether through free agency or you can just draft a ton of wide receivers. This wide receiver class isn't nearly as deep as recent years. That's a concern. They have a lot of good tight ends. Miley Cox, Jelani Woods looked really good as a rookie. Uh, Kylan Granson has flashed at times. Um, Andrew Ogletree was special. I think he towards ACL before the season and had a really good training camp. He'll be back. So maybe you, you build through the middle of the field. I don't know, but whoever the quarterback is, is going to need help. And to Debo's point, maybe it's someone like a Boston Scott who can come in and take some of the pressure off along with Jonathan Taylor, or to your point, maybe you, you add to the Michael Pittman wide receiver room, unless you're trying to train Michael Pittman to get up to get that quarterback. And Steichen's not blind to this. I mean, he saw the impact that A.J. Brown had on Jalen Hurts this year. Putting him into that equation made that offense so much more lethal. And again, it's not rocket scientist to say, hey, you insert a good wide receiver, your offense is going to be better. Obviously, that's going to be the case. But you do see that when you add these guys. I said it before the year. I thought that the A.J. Brown addition was going to be like Steph Diggs in Buffalo for the respective quarterback position. So you bring in a guy like Will Levis and you give him a veteran receiver like Michael Pittman, that's going to do the world for him as much as having Jonathan Taylor to run things in the backfield as well. The other thing that I think is worth talking about, though, as we're talking about Steichen here, is that he may only have to build one side of his staff. The Colts right now have retained Gus Bradley as defensive coordinator, and they haven't allowed them to take 
other jobs that are, you know, uh, lateral, lateral jobs. Yeah. So he may only have to poach offensive guys here now, especially if he likes Gus Bradley. And I would assume that's been part of the conversation before he's agreed to this as well. So there is some continuity here going from Frank Reich to Jeff Saturday now to Steichen. You do have that defensive side pretty much still set. Debo, let me ask you, how uh, upset are you at losing Steichen? Because that's a good indication when you ask a fan about it. Like, you know, if Matt Canada got this job, I would be driving Matt Canada from Pittsburgh to Indianapolis. Like, that's how happy I would be. How do you feel, Debo? Yeah, I'm, I'm upset. I don't know if I'm, like, preventing him from taking off on the plane, um, but I'm definitely not <laughs> driving him to, to Indianapolis. I, I think it, it stinks. I mean, there's a good rapport with his coaching staff. I totally trust Sirianni. And, and Steichen, and, and there's a chance that the Eagles could lose potentially all three coordinators. Now, it might be firing their, their special teams coordinator because they were among the worst units in the league. Steichen, you hate to lose. Jonathan Gannon did not have a good second half, but I, I would hate to lose all three coordinators and have that sort of turnover coming off of a Super Bowl appearance and uh, near Super Bowl win. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pain in those last few words sell so here hard to take. I will say this: like we were all saying after they won the Super Bowl with Doug Peterson and, and Frank Reich left, like oh they're they're going to be terrible, and turns out they just recycled their coordinators and head coach and and, and were just fine. So like, let me ask you, um, because when you look at the the Colts' recent history, they're actually not terrible. You go back to Lux last year; they went ten and six, went to the playoffs. He retired to go seven and nine with Jacoby, eleven and five the next year with Philip Rivers. Nine and eight with Carson, the week seven, week 18 game lost, ruined everything for everyone. And then last year was a train wreck with the, the aforementioned four wins. Where does this team realistically fit in the division? You mentioned the Jaguars are not in the same conversation as the Chiefs, obviously. I don't know. We might be overselling the, the Jaguars. I don't know. So you tell me, how, how does that division shake out in the AFC? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say that they're this like powerhouse or anything along those lines, but Jacksonville, I still think, is the team to beat in that division. I don't know if I necessarily think that they're like, this superior team, but they have a stable head coach and they have an up and coming quarterback that at the time he was drafted, everybody's calling him Andrew Luck and everybody's calling him Peyton Manning. So if you start to live up to that and you just came off a playoff appearance and a playoff win, all right, you got to look, be looked at a little bit seriously. I think Tennessee as it's currently constituted is number two, but I don't know what they are going to look like when we actually start 2023, as I mentioned at Ryan Tannehill, but I still put them at number two. And then you kind of get a little interesting because it's really going to see, you got to see how this, all this stuff plays out. I like both hiring Steichen for Indianapolis and I like D'Amico Ryan's going to Houston and you have two first round picks. If you're Houston, number two and number 12, both of you, you teams are going to be in it for quarterbacks, whether or not Houston maybe goes after Jimmy Garoppolo, who I've, I've speculated that that could possibly be the case. If you bring in a Jimmy Garoppolo and go defense with those two picks, and if you're Indianapolis and you go young at quarterback, you might be the last team in that division because you're kind of building something over the long term. Yeah, I'm thinking I hesitated because I was thinking about like th this draft. These teams are obviously in the same division, the Colts and the Texans. One picks two, the other picks four, and they're going to be tied for the next 10 years in terms of you took that quarterback instead of this quarterback. Sort of like the Mr. Bisky versus Deshaun and, and Patrick Mahomes situation sure. when the Bears – well, I think they traded up to get Mitch by the time it was all said and done. And, and you know, he lost his job to Kenny Pickett, but that, I don't want to talk about that. But so if you pass on Will Levis and he ends up blowing up and Bryce Young gets hurt, and it's just hypothetical, I hope both, both guys are Hall of Famers, but that's the conversation. Those are questions you're going to have to answer. If you get Jimmy G and he gets hurt, well, we've seen that happen before, and you don't take CJ Stroud if you're the Texans and then the, the Colts hit a home run, those are questions you're going to have to answer. But I agree with you. I, I love the hiring of, of, for both teams. I think that the Texans might be closer than we give them credit for, but that's only because we expect them to win one game. Right. I, I think they have the two first round picks. Um, they showed it. I mean, they played hard the last two years for both coaches they fired. Uh, so hopefully that that carries over to D'Amico Ryans. Uh, I give them credit for sticking with the African American coaches. So that, <laughs> that's something. Um, but they got to figure out the quarterback situation because I don't think it's Davis Mills. And I'll say this Houston does have their, their top five in the NFL right now in cap space. So they Ooh. could. They have two first they could round pull picks. The Jaguars. The Jaguars did this last year. They have two two first round picks and money to spend. That's a very easy way to start revamping. So if you get a quarterback, like I think that 
If you're Houston, I think an interesting plan is to go defense at two and twelve and and, and trade or uh, acquire Jimmy Garoppolo. Woo. That is that, that, that is spicy. That gets you in the conversation. That in is an spicy. AFC South. But I mean, I, I don't want to compare him to the Lions because the Lions' offense was actually in pretty good shape last year. But they did get Aiden Hutchinson early. They didn't need any offensive players. They're not quite there offensively. But Detroit has turned things around quickly again, in part because of the front office and, and the coaching staff, and that appears to be in place. Like, um. I like Chris Ballard, but you could tell during that press conference where they were announcing Jeff Saturday that he was being held hostage. Yeah. It, it wasn't like he was he making blinking too money. many times. <laughs> he, yeah, a lot of blinking going on. Uh, maybe the, 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 the balance of power is back where it needs to be. But um, all right, one last thing. We'll get out of here. Is the AFC South still the worst division in, in, the, in the American Football Conference? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. So. In, the, in the AFC, for sure. NFC, I mean, you still you're sticking in the South. I mean, that that division, the NFC South is the worst in football right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Debo, anything else we need to hit on? No, I mean, I don't I don't know how much you know about uh Brian Johnson. I, I feel like we've discussed him before, but the Eagles quarterback coach uh was very sought after, I think, this offseason. So if they're able to retain him, bump him up to offensive coordinator, that that seems to be the apparent move to me. I know there's others out there on the market. But at this time of year, I think keeping him has worked maybe even more than Steichen on on Jalen Hurts' development. I think that is a big key for the Eagles to retain him. And we'll see what happens today with Jonathan Gannon and and the Cardinals. That feels like a sort of a circle of life Frank Reich staying with Carson Wentz situation that you're talking about. JJ, I was just watching HQ before we came on. Jonathan Jones mentioned um, – Johnson, and it did sound like he was going to stay. I think is what JJ said. What happens if Jonathan Gannon leaves? What's the backup plan there, Debo? That is a good question. Ooh. Where's Where's Jim Schwartz right now? Oh, he just signed. So where did he sign, Sully? I don't know how long ago he took a job somewhere. Um, well, my advice to you would have been to never have fired Sean McDermott, my former college classmate at William Mary. I went to William Mary, Sully. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, Cleveland Browns. Yeah. Do I have that correctly? Is that right? The Browns? Yep. Cleveland Browns, defensive coordinator. All right. There you go. Joe Woods, uh, I think he, he wasn't retained, but he's since glashed on somewhere else. Joe Woods, I can't remember. I'll have to look that up for the next show. All right. That's I it. Think it for was the... kind of a. What? I, I was just going to. I think it was kind of a baller move that they hired Vic Fangio for two weeks and probably oh, yeah. paid him like a million bucks. That just um, I know he's he's down with the Dolphins, but when I heard that news on, on Sunday morning, it got me very excited for hiring the best defensive coordinator in the world, but he's off the table as well. Well, well Debo, I have a defensive coordinator that is also an offensive coordinator in New England, if you, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, Debo, do you wear the Mamula jersey? Is that what I saw on the on the Instagram machine? Yes. The uh, What color green is that? Kelly green? Kelly green. That's a, that's a Kelly that green. Pretty, that was, that was, a, was like it, the, what the kids say, Sally? That's Super Bowl. good fit, drip, whatever. They are, uh, Eagles are now one and one in Super Bowls in which I wear that jersey. So, so next if they go next around, year, what are you wearing? Might make a switch. Hundred percent going to be Jalen and her jersey. So predictable. <laughs> All right, that's it for the Shane Steichen Emergency Podcast. He is your new Colts head coach until he pulls the Josh McDaniels and comes back to Philly. Um, by the way, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, we'll be back later this afternoon to take one last look at Super Bowl Fifty Seven. And if you're watching us on YouTube Live, we'll also be back at what two p.m. Eastern time. Me and Rick Spielman to do with the first pick draft podcast. And if you're listening, go back and listen to those at your leisure. All right. That's it. I'm Ryan. That's Sully. See you guys later.